Hello everyone, my name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Moto. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here and you like this kind of content, I hope you'll consider subscribing. In today's episode on the Transout, we are doing some more modifications and more upgrades. The main modification that we're gonna cover in this episode is going to be putting on upgraded suspension. Although we're also doing some other things, uh, looking at the exhaust, looking at a navigation system, adding some auxiliary lights, and maybe even a few other items. Now, a couple things I just wanna give you as a disclaimer up front before we get into it. Uh, number one, uh, for some of the parts, depending on uh, the resellers and if I have relationships with them, I may earn a small commission from certain parts you see in the video. So as always, I do ask that if you wanna support the channel, please use my shopping links, which will be below for anything you wish to purchase. But please know that uh, that factor or, or that aff affiliate commission doesn't really impact how I view the products or what products I choose uh, to put here on the channel. It's just a nice bonus that I get. Also, one more thing, I'm absolutely not saying that you need to go out and spend thousands of dollars on your adventure bike. Obviously, I'm not saying that. My point in doing this kind of video and showing you all these upgrades is how good can we make the Transalp? If we just wanna kinda of go nuts and really invest in this bike, and bring out its full potential, uh, what can we do? What are the pros and cons of that? Now, for you as an adventure rider, whether you have a Transalp or some other bike, you're gonna have to choose modifications based on uh, not only your budget, but your personal needs, which may be different than mine. And I'm running a YouTube channel. I need to show all these things. I wanna put everything out there that I can to test. So I'm obviously going kind of overboard as compared to what you might be doing. So uh, I, I understand some of these things are expensive and I totally get that. But my job is to show everything that can possibly be done to a Transalp and the pros and cons of that. All right, so with that, uh, let's get into the garage. All right, here's one modification that we're not doing in the garage because the installation was done for me. So here's what happened. Yoshimura uh, emailed me, we've had a bit of a relationship over the years, and they said, uh, hey, we need a Transalp to kind of certify or do some final testing on our exhaust system. And so I said, yeah, uh, take my bike, you know, for as long as you need and go ahead and uh, do that. And of course you, you get the pipe when you, when you do this, you, your, your bike comes back with the exhaust on it. So this is the Yoshimura RS12 uh, slip-on uh, muffler for the Transalp. Uh, it saves about one and a half pounds uh, versus the stock system. So not a huge weight savings really, but it's there. Uh, the main reason you would get this is for the sound, which is really phenomenal. And I'll put that here. It's a nice, deep, barky growl. It just makes the bike sound really aggressive. The bike already sounds pretty good and you get the intake sound, but now you get this nice throaty exhaust sound as well. Um, and, and it looks great, you know, there's that. You can tune the sound so they do have a quiet insert for it if you want. Um, you know, Yoshimura makes really nice exhaust systems they have for a long time. Uh, whether or not it's gonna be worth it for you to do this on your, your bike, that's completely up to you. Um, but I can definitely vouch and say this, this is a nice exhaust system. So thank you very much Yoshimura for uh, letting me uh, test this out and using my bike as the test mule for this. I really enjoy having it and uh, it's really nice to be riding around uh, with a Transalp that sounds this good. All right, these are accessory LED lights. So let me show you what we've got here. 3D Cycle Parts sent these out. I'll link to them below. Great uh, small business here in the USA. Um, they're called the Mojave Lights. They mount to the triple clamp, the lower triple clamps here on a bracket. So that's really slick. That's nice. So they turn with the steering. So I like to add aux lights to all my bike builds because it makes riding at night so much safer, so much more enjoyable. Plus, in the daytime, you get the conspicuity or the visibility from other traffic. So for this kit, um, it looks pretty simple. There's a wiring harness. It's all pre-made for you. The plugs in the factory connectors. Oh, this is not part of the kit. This is a this is another thing they sent me. 3D cycle parts. It's an axle wrench and, a, and an extra wrench for the. It supplements the factory toolkit to make the factory toolkit more complete. Um, there's some lens, different lenses here for the lights. Another connector and another connector here, I think, for under the seat. Um, this is something different. That's for another project later. So um, 
let's get started with this. I think we have to disassemble a little bit with the fairings and stuff, but it doesn't look like too bad of an install. So I'll check back here in a few minutes. All right, so 3D Cycle Parts, he has a great uh, instructional or install vid on his website. So check that out if you're gonna do these yourself. And I don't do install vids, that's not the business I'm in. But to show you how kind of easy this is, the dashboard pops out, there's two uh, screws, and then there's a couple clips, and a dashboard pulls out, there's one connector. So that's really easy to take out, actually. And then this, this harness drops in here, connects to your factory headlight harness, and the auxiliary power plug, which is right here, all easily accessible and everything plugs into the factory uh, connections. So that's awesome. And it's tied It's tied into the high beam switch. So this is exactly the setup I always look for. I want my aux lights to come on with my high beam because I need to be able to dim the lights by just pressing one button when there's oncoming traffic because these kind of lights are too bright to run. If there's oncoming traffic, it's unsafe and illegal. So that's the setup I'm always looking for. So I'm super happy to see that's what the case is here. So I'm gonna uh, get on with the install and check back. All right, I'm almost done with the install. You can see the brackets here mount to the triple clamps, the lower triple clamps. I've got to tuck my wiring in. They give you some nice reusable cable ties for that. Really like how these lights are down here. They're gonna separate from the main beam to give you that nice visibility. Um, plugging all this stuff back in, that was super easy. There's a little plug under the seat that you have to plug in with the fuse in it. That takes about literally about 10 seconds to do that. I mean, I'm just super thrilled with that. So I just need to get the wiring kind of buttoned up. I'm also changing out the front turn signals to these uh, Yoshimura turn signals to match the rear ones that they installed with the tail tidy kit. So I'm gonna do that real quick and then we'll take the bike outside and have a look at uh, how these lights work. All right, as you can see here, the installation of the 3D Cycle Parts Mojave LED lights is complete. No joke, no exaggeration, this was the easiest aux light kit I've ever done, and I've done a lot of these. You plug in a few connectors, four bolts uh, there to mount them up to the triple clamps, and you're good to go. Uh, and they integrate to the high beam. So let me show you how these work. I also got the Yoshimura uh, LED sequential signals on, so when you have the low beam on, you uh, just have your typical low beam, the lights are completely turned off. Now when you turn the high beam on, then, the lights activate automatically with your high beam there. So you're safe and legal with traffic and all that kind of stuff. So that's really great. And then let me show you the turn signals, how these guys work. You can see that there. And they match on the back, of course. Same thing. And of course, I just have to fire this up because I never get tired of listening to this Yoshimura exhaust. Such a nice, such a nice piece of kit there. That exhaust, the fender eliminator is great too. Just got to listen to this thing. Oh, yeah. See, the Yoshimura signals have running lights in them, just like the factory signals. Actually, the factory signals are perfectly fine. You don't need to do this upgrade, really. It just kind of looks good, and I like the sequential part. And then on the back, you can see here we've got, that's a bright license plate light on that Yoshimura tail tidy kit. Um, the rear turn signals, of course, do not have running lights. Let me turn on the hazard lights so you can see how these signals look. So they're kind of cool. I don't know how well it shows up in video, but they're uh, sequential or progressive out to the side. So that's kind of cool. I do, I do like that actually quite a bit. I'll show you here from the back. Yeah, pretty good. I'm pretty happy with them. But again, this is just really a bling upgrade. You really don't need to do that unless it's something you really want. Now here's the factory light, all right? And we've talked about how this is really pretty inadequate, um, you know, in previous videos uh, that I've done. And let me flip on the aux lights. So you can see the difference is literally, no pun intended, night and day. So there's factory low beam. Here's with the high beam. But the factory high beam is completely washed out. Can't even notice it uh, once these aux lights come on. So it's probably no joke, probably a five or 10 fold difference in the light output. So it lights up. And the nice thing is, see how when I'm turning my handlebars, so especially for you off-road riders, because this turns with the forks, um, you know, slow speed corners, maneuvering, stuff like that, you have the light going where you want to go. Now, let's go on, on a short ride. 
The other thing that I wanted to comment on is this Yoshimura exhaust. Um, it really, it do, it's just the right volume in my opinion. I've had some exhaust on bikes in the past that I just felt had too much drone, were too loud. I don't think that's the case with this. It has a nice throaty sound, but it doesn't drone on the highway. It's not annoying. And I'm typically not a fan of aftermarket pipes, so it takes a lot to win me over. So let's pull up here on the highway. So most of the time on a country road at night, I'm going to be running with my high beams or my aux lights on like this. So I have really, really good visibility. You can see the difference there. There's the factory light and I, with the factory light, especially here where there's deer everywhere, I feel really endangered by deer and animals or just can't see things. But with these aux lights, it lights up everything. And I really have a huge confidence safety factor in terms of spotting a deer or seeing an animal or, you know, or whatever it might be, just being able to see the road or see the trail. So that's tremendous. That's one of the best upgrades I've done to this bike. All right, let's talk briefly about navigation. So for navigation over the years, I, well, I'm a fan of having it, number one, because I like to do, have routing, I like to see maps I, and off-road, I like to see where the trails are, navigation on different routes. So I've used uh, my phone with different apps. I've used, you know, Gaia and uh, things like that, Rever. I've used Garmin's, many different Garmin's over the years. I have a Garmin Zumo XT right now, which I've been using a lot, and you've seen that in a lot of my other videos. However, for this bike build, I am doing something different. So Drive Mode Dashboard is a company based out of, oh uh, gosh, I somewhere in South America, I believe. Um, and I'm sorry if I get any of this wrong, but they sent me their Android-based 8-inch navigation tablet. It is simply astounding. I've never seen such a navigational piece of equipment for motorcycling in my life. It's just astonishing what they've done. It's been out for four or five years. They developed their own application. Uh, it's Android based and then they have a tablet that they sell, which I don't know if they make, the, uh, if they have the tablet made specially, but I'll sh let me just show you what this thing is all about. So here's the tablet here. So this is the eight inch tab. They also have a cell phone size one, which is more like six inches, I believe. I wanted to try the bigger one. They sent all this to me for testing and I'm super uh, happy to be able to do that. So it's essentially a extreme, it's an Android tablet. So if you quit this app, you can actually use it as a regular Android tablet, which is awesome because that unlocks all sorts of other applications you can use or Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, if you wanna to connect to headsets or mapping or whatever, you can do that as well. But this is their proprietary app called the DMD, a drive mode dashboard app. So you've got, you know, navigation in here. I have, it's on night mode now because it has a light center. Um, you can load all sorts of maps, do all sorts of advanced routing. Uh, it's incredible the different ways you can set this up. It has so much customization. It goes so far beyond the typical Garmin that I can't even describe just how much more advanced this is. Uh, you can also tie it into the bike's OBD2 port and get bike information in terms of RPM and speed and temperatures. You can program all that on here. Um, you can also, I have the handlebar remote, which I haven't hooked up yet, which is here. So this is for people who do racing or run rallies or do a lot of navigational stuff. You can have this here and use, uh, you know, toggle through your road book or do whatever you need to do. It has a joystick, two buttons and another up and down click here. So that's phenomenal. The, the overall customization and, and ability of this thing is, is beyond description. It's, it's truly phenomenal from what I've seen so far. So I have it mounted in a way, I have it on an adjustable ram mount, which you can see here. It uses the, the base that it comes with is a locking base that locks with the key and it uses the amps uh, bolt pattern, which is pretty universal. So I happen to have some of that kind of uh, mounting stuff uh, in the shop here. So actually I have it mounted where I can still see my dashboard. I have this camera at eye level right now, so I can still see my dashboard. It does make my dashboard look small though, I will admit that. So maybe looking at the smaller uh, tablet version of the, the smaller one would be something to think about. But I but I like this because I can have a huge, I can have a huge map here. And the level of detail is, is incredible. It does routing, does all sorts of stuff. Um, and it doesn't require internet, obviously, for this to work because it's motorcycle navigation, so it runs off the stored maps that you download. Um, 
really, there's so much to go through here. I can't possibly even scratch the surface of this right now, uh, but I'll be testing this out over the next year or two um, and doing some comparisons and some guides for this versus Garmin versus using your phone, uh, what different, different options that you have. So anyway, I'm super impressed with this. The only installation was really just putting the RAM mount on my bike uh, here and then running the power cord kind of a little bit under the tank and I just connected it to the battery. I wanted to connect it to the battery so I can use, I didn't want it to turn off with the key. I get kind of annoyed when I have that set up so I just turn it off manually now so I can plan my, do my navigation stuff with the bike off if I want to do that. Um, and then it has a sleep mode and then I turn it all the way off so you don't drain your battery. But anyway, I'm super impressed with this so far. Um, but we'll have to get, give you more updates on this later. All right, well, this is it. This is the big upgrade for the TransAlp 750. I'm going to be installing the Tractive uh, front suspension cartridges and springs and the Tractive rear shock. So I think first maybe we should talk about the methodology of this. Why am I doing this? What did it cost? And so let's just talk about that a little bit. Let me flip this camera around. So my reasoning for doing this upgrade, despite the rather high expense, which I'm gonna show you here in a second, is I wanna see what is the ultimate capability of this platform, the Honda, the new Honda Transout platform. A lot of people have said, this is just more of a road touring bike, it's not very good off-road, it's too soft, it doesn't have the features we want. But the truth is, if you're willing to spend a little money and time, you can do some pretty major upgrades to this bike and transform it. So my goal is to make the ultimate sort of Japanese midsize adventure bike unicorn that everybody's been talking about with the features that everybody says they want. Top level suspension, cruise control, tubeless wheels, uh, all the other stuff, you know, lighting, whatever, navigation. We're doing that with this bike and we're gonna see what it costs and if it's worth it. And we're gonna be honest about that. Let's talk about what the suspension upgrade costs and I'll show you kind of what we're dealing with here. So I blacked out my name and address because I don't really want you guys having that. Sorry. Um, so, yes. Um, I know. Don't turn off the video right now. You're seeing the prices here. This is in US dollars. So $16.95 for the uh, front cartridges. $16.95 for the extreme uh, preload adjustment um, rear shock. So total $3,390 before tax. Now this is not really my receipt because I paid, a, a, I got a discounted price um, because I'm testing it out and promoting, you know, helping show attractive products. So I didn't pay full price, um, but I'm not, I can't reveal what that is. Now down here you can see the setup notes. So 200 miles on the bike, standard height. I went with a standard height. I didn't want to go higher. There was an option to go plus 25 millimeter travel front and back to lift the bike up, but I really like the low seat height and the low center of gravity of this bike, and I was really worried about messing that up. Plus, I think 200 millimeters of travel is enough for an adventure bike. Uh, that's what GSs have, um, just in case you're wondering. Uh, no passenger, 220 pounds with my gear on. That includes riding gear, boots, uh, hydration pack, all that kind of stuff. Usually carry about 30 pounds of luggage. Um, sometimes carry up to 60 pounds of luggage when I'm camping. So that's the setup notes. now. I know this is a lot of money. I fully, fully understand that. And I think it's gonna be a very select few people who love the trends up enough to really want to do this transformative upgrade. And it is most likely gonna be a transformative upgrade and take the bike to the next level. I think there's enough good things about the Transalp, in my opinion, the great engine, uh, the good fuel capacity, fuel range, the extreme comfort, uh, the price of the bike, some of the other features that it has. I think there's an end the fact that it's a Honda I think there's enough good here to justify, especially for me, doing some of these upgrades. So here's the fork cartridges. They're a complete um, internal fork replacement. So you can see the springs, cartridges are in here. It's a closed cartridge design. So it's really quite, uh, quite fancy, quite nice. You can see the top of the forks here have rebound and compression adjustment and preload adjustment. They included tools for the install, which was super awesome. They even included the oil, the proper weight oil, and the quantity you need. That was awesome. Here's the rear shock. So this is... This is the top level stuff that Tractive has for adventure motorcycles. I didn't want to go the low end or the mid range. I went all out and got the extreme version. So the shock has high and low speed compression for uh, compression adjuster, separate circuits, and it has a rebound adjuster, and it has this really nice remote preload adjuster. I mean, just look at the build quality 
and the, I mean it's just really phenomenal on this stuff so I'm really excited to get this on installing the rear shock is going to be a matter of pulling the rear wheel off um, so we can move the swing arm around disconnecting the suspension linkage in here and then pulling the shock out uh, getting it to the top bolt which is inside here kind of it's kind of hard to see it's always kind of hard to get the, the socket on that on that bolt there should drop out fairly easily in fact I don't really know for sure. It looks like actually we might not have to even remove the rear tire. We're gonna try that first. If we just drop the suspension linkage and see if we can just swap the shock out without even messing with the rear tire, that'd be kind of cool. But I have the bike up on the lift uh, to make this easier. And then to do the front forks, I'm just gonna pull the forks down off the bike because it's just gonna be easier to do and then to set the oil level with the forks off. All right, so uh, I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of the install. This is not an install video. I don't do install vids at Big Rock Moto. I'm not, I'm not into that sort of thing. But I'll show you a little bit what's involved. Uh, when it's all done, then of course, we're gonna go out for a ride and uh, see how it is. And we're gonna have to make some adjustments. So you have to commit to being able to tune this stuff in. You don't just throw it on your bike and then that's good forever. You need to be committed to doing some tuning and adjustments. After all, you just spend over $3,000 on suspension. Well, as you can see, the shock came out without too much hassle at all. I removed the rear linkage bolt. I removed the lower shock mounting bolt. I removed the upper shock mounting bolt, which has a nut on the other end, which I didn't find out until I realized that was spinning. Really not that hard to do. And once you lower or remove that top mounting bolt, the shock will then come out. The shock does have a collar and it has these two kind of bushings or things here that you got to keep track of that kind of fell out. You can see the factory shock here. Um, you know, it's really interesting that there's a little thing here that says soft and hard, like, like there was supposed to be an adjuster here, and they took it off. So that's interesting. It does have this little reservoir, and it has this preload adjustment um, ring here, which is kind of a pain to use, uh, but they do give you the tool for that in the stock toolkit. So there's our stock shock, and of course there's our tractive, which we're going to go ahead and install now. All right, I'm getting ready to finish the install on the rear shock. So I've got the preload, the hydraulic preload adjustment mounted here. It mounts on a bracket off the passenger peg and exhaust hanger. I did want to point out that compared to its competitor, the Tenere 700, the Transop does have a removable exhaust and passenger peg hanger. So if you were to damage this or bend this, this bolts onto the frame so you're not totaling your bike if you bend this. So that is something I just wanted to point out. But anyway, back on topic. So this bolts in here, really nice kind of factory look almost, except of course you see Tractive and you see this cool anodized knob here that has a hose that goes in here to the shock. And then I've just got to put the lower shock bolt on and reattach the linkage. I ended up just taking the linkage off just to get the shock assembly up in. It was just a little bit easier. You can see the adjusters in here. And Tractive gives you, I just realized this, that the, I got one with the shock and one with the fork kit, but they give you this really awesome, uh, it looks like a screwdriver or a nut driver, but then in the cap, this is almost like custom made for them, really nifty. They have the exact tools you need the bits you need to adjust your suspension. So this will be going in the toolkit permanently with the trans up so I can do my adjustments. They give you owner's manuals, they give you install guides for all the parts. Um, so overall, I'm actually super impressed. They even give you the setup data for, depending on what model you got, the clicks and the preload and stuff that they recommend to start out at. So I'm really, really um, impressed with this kit so far. All right, the rear shock is installed. You can see that in there. Everything is buttoned up. We got our shock mounting bolts tight. You got to kind of grab the nut over here, kind of sneak the wrench or your extension through this kind of hole here into that nut. Make sure your uh, dog bone or your linkage bolts and nuts are all tight to spec, you know, use your torque specs. And now we're going to move on to the front suspension cartridges. So we're going to start by taking off the front wheel, um, the discs, the fender. I'm going to have to pull these lights off and then we'll be able to go ahead and pull these forks out of the front of the bike, and then we'll go ahead and get our cartridges installed.
like to do the forks one leg at a time. So I got the right fork leg out of the bike. You can see that here. And I'll show you on the bike. So I just, again, it's easier for me if I just look at it one at a time. Uh, and then the fender can kind of stay partly attached. The brake lines can kind of hang from there. So I took off the brakes, the wheel, um, uh, the left hand fender bolts that go, that attach to the left fork leg, and then the triple clamp bolts uh, upper and lower, and then the, this fork tube slides out. So it's really not as complicated as it looks to do that. So now what I'm gonna do is, um, following the instructions from the kit, is you know remove the internals of this fork, get the oil drained out, and then we'll go ahead and install a new cartridge and a new oil. All right, you can see here, I've got the rebound cartridge installed and a spring in the right uh, fork leg. Now, if you haven't done something like this before, here's our stock components, uh, the cartridge and cap and the stock spring, drain out the oil. If you haven't done something like this before, as I was saying, it's a little bit intimidating. You've got a lot going on. You've got counter pressure on different wrenches to tighten up. You've got to set the oil or the air gap, which is the distance between the top of the oil in here and the top of this, this inner tube. And you have to push down the, the inner uh, damper while you're doing that. And you have to stick your ruler or measuring device in there. There's other ways to do that. The professionals do it in different ways. I do like the tools that Tractive gives us. It helps. Installation instructions are pretty good. It uh, just takes a minute to think it through. If you if you don't know what you're doing, just stop and give them a call or get a buddy to help you. Um, it's And the other tip I would have is the uh, Allen uh, bolt on the bottom of the fork leg. It's best to break that loose before you remove the fork from the motorcycle and then just snug it back in a tiny bit because once it's off the bike, when you try to remove that um, nut from the bottom, it wants to just spin the fork. So it can be a little fiddly to get that off. I use... Uh, this little, you know, this little um, impact electric battery operated impact wrench, uh, 3 8 inch is really handy because it kind of can just spin things off real quick. It also helped me get the fork caps off. Fork caps are something that you probably should take off or loosen before you take that, before you loosen the triple clamps. It just makes life a little bit easier. But I've done this before. I kind of know how to do it with my different tools that I have. So anyway, um, get the air gap set, which I just did. I've got the cap back on. Uh, the new cap, uh, new spring, all the new internals. Now I'm going to tighten this back up, put this fork back on the bike, and then basically the same exact thing on the other fork leg. All right, well, the suspension install is done. I got the forks all assembled back on the bike, got the brakes back on, everything torqued up to spec, and uh, double check, triple check stuff if you're working on suspension and wheels, tires, all that kind of stuff. Um, the only thing left to do is to get geared up and with the about hour of daylight left I have on this short winter day just after Christmas, uh, go test ride the bike and kind of give you my first impressions, uh, keeping in mind that we're probably going to have to do some tuning in and adjusting as we go. So uh, with that, uh, let's head out on a ride. All right, let's do some test riding with all the new modifications. So. I'm kind of breaking this down into three phases. Phase one was all the crash protection, the foot pegs, the hand guards, the basic luggage, a few other things like that. Phase two was what I just completed. So the suspension, the fender eliminator, the exhaust, the auxiliary lights, and the DMD or drive more dashboard uh, tablet right here for navigation. I think that's about it. Um, oh, and the, you know, the turn signals and stuff like that. So that's kind of phase two. And then phase three is coming up soon. That's going to be the cruise control, electronic cruise control from Mick Cruise and the tubeless wheel conversion kit from uh, Altex. So that's going to be phase three. Uh, and we'll cover the cost of all this in a little separate section uh, in this video and in the next few videos. So let's go ahead and uh, jump on and go for a ride. Now, the first thing I noticed with the new suspension is that on the old on the stock suspension, when I lifted the bike off the side stand, the whole bike would sag down about maybe one to two inches. It really doesn't have much static sag right now. So I don't know if things need to break in or we need to take some preload out. And then when I sit on the motorcycle, I notice that I don't get that huge amount of sag, especially in the back, that I did with the factory suspension. So if you, if you are really sensitive to the height of the bike, keep in mind that when you get proper spring rates and better suspension, that your bike's probably going to be tall because you probably had too much sag uh, if your spring rates were set up for a lighter rider. The Trans Alp has sprung very softly. So now that we have proper springs, our ride height is a little bit higher. So that's something you have to keep in mind. There's always a potential downside when you do these things. So let's go ahead and uh, start the bike up so you can hear the beautiful Yoshi exhaust. I don't know if it's coming through 
in the video but man that Yoshi exhaust sounds awesome with the quick shifter so the things I'm noticing I mean I definitely can tell that the bike the bike does feel a little bit taller and it I can feel a little more bumps coming through it doesn't feel quite quite as uh, squishy and soft of course we can make adjustments this suspension is highly tunable for all that all right we're at my little off-road testing area it's getting dark so the picture quality is going to be a little low i apologize for that but i wanted to go ahead and uh, give you a true first impression after getting this thing installed so uh, let's just rip around a little bit and uh, kind of give our first impressions keeping in mind that i'm going to have to make adjustments to the suspension got my traction and abs turned off as i always do in the dirt on this bike one of the huge annoyances with this bike there's really two huge annoyances one is the air filter being under the fuel tank the second is traction control and abs is not useful off-road and you have to turn it off and then it keeps resetting so other than that i really do love the transalp hit some of these big ruts here wow that's insane this is a completely completely different motorcycle oh my word this is nothing like the stock bike nothing nothing like the stock bike at all holy moly Whoa. I have to contain myself to not go too fast. I'm going to hit one of these big embedded rocks and bend my rim. This suspension performance is phenomenal for a first ride. With this factory bike, I would have to slow way down for all of these ruts and all these rocks. With this setup, it's a completely different animal. Take some of these bigger hits. Wow. No bottoming out. So these, the forks and the shocks have a hydraulic bump stop. I don't know if I'm using the right word, but it's like a hydraulic bump stop and they are when you get to the end of the travel. This bike is this bike is on a whole nother level now a whole nother level I need to tune uh, do this in the light of day literally uh, another probably tomorrow um, but oh my god the suspension the, the number one thing you can do to, to increase the performance of any motorcycle is the suspension period end of story like forget exhaust forget engine forget power all that kind of stuff the suspension is the thing that can revolutionize the performance. So off-road before, this bike was very bouncy, very soft. And you could ride, you just had to ride kind of slow to moderate. Now you can charge like you would on any of the high-end adventure bikes. Uh, KTM 890R, um, you know, Ducati Desert X, Touareg 660, it's more comparable to that. It doesn't quite have the, the long stroke that some of those bikes do, so you don't quite have the total plushness on the some of the bigger chop and bigger hits that you do on like the bikes with the 240 millimeter travel um, but for a 200 millimeter travel bike this is the best I've experienced this will blow a Tenere 700 out of the water uh, compared to that stock suspension on a T7 so I can answer that question already um, but we need more testing we need more time to tune things in but I am super impressed so far I mean it should be good uh, when you're spending my highway pigs gunning all crazy here it should be good when you're spending you know thirty five hundred dollars so i would expect that now let's go test it on the highway 
All right, so I've been riding the Transalp uh, for a couple weeks now since I finished the upgrades. And I wanna talk about the suspension. The, the suspension is the big upgrade here that is the big expense and transforms the bike the most. So people wanna know, you know, is it worth it to spend so much money uh, on aftermarket suspension? It's, it's over a third of the price of the entire bike that you're spending again to upgrade the suspension. Is it worth it for most people to do that? Well, for most people, no, obviously not, because it just doesn't make any sense. If you want that level of performance, you're probably not buying a Transalp anyway, or maybe you're buying KTM 890R or a Touareg 660. Um, so probably not. Now, I'm not saying that I don't love the suspension, I do. It's amazing. And I think if you want, a, if you like everything about the Transalp that we've covered in the series, which there's a lot to like, and you want the best performance you can get out of it, then I think this is the suspension to get. I mean, in terms of the adjustability and the performance and the, the tunability of it uh, and the ride quality on and off road, it's, it's phenomenal. And it brings it up to be very competitive with those more expensive, more premium adventure bikes. Um, for most people, you know, you could probably get away with just doing a spring change, a spring upgrade, although the suspension is going to be very springy and very bouncy, not have great control. If you want the next step up from that, you could do like a valving and, and springs. You could do valves and springs at like your local suspension shop. Could cost anywhere between maybe $1,000, $1,500 US, somewhere in that range. Uh, see what they could do. You'd probably get a lot of performance for the buck by doing that. But if you want the ultimate, yes, this system is amazing. Um, is it worth it for most people? No, this is a super premium option and you have to be really, really committed to this bike to want to invest that level of money into it. Uh, I'm happy to have it. I'm grateful to be able to test it and I do recommend it, but just keep all those things in mind. I try to be as fair and balanced as I can reviewing stuff on this channel. Um, so anyway, there's my honest impressions. In terms, of the, in terms of some details about how the suspension is performing for me, so a couple things. Um, the rear shock is amazing. I don't wanna make any changes to that. Just playing with the clickers a little bit and the preload. Uh, the preload, I have the preload almost all the way out on the adjuster, uh, which I think is good because I've been riding it without luggage and without a passenger. So if I did add luggage and stuff, I, I have that preload adjustability there. Cause I'm not gonna get any lighter than just myself riding it with a backpack and maybe a tiny bag on the back. The front suspension, uh, I'm going to work with Tractive to get maybe go up one on the spring rate. I feel like, I feel like uh, I've had a few bottoms out on the front, uh, bottoms out, I can't say it, bottom outs on the front suspension. And I think it just might be one spring rate too low for me. So uh, that's understandable. I'm one of the first customers that they have with this setup. So um, totally understandable there. I think I'll just go up one spring rate and I'll report back later towards the end of the series on that. Uh, but beyond that, it's it, it's dialed. The adjustments work really well. The, the control, the feeling's really good. I can ride this bike really fast now and keep up with people on 890Rs and whatever you want. Uh, the suspension really is that good. It doesn't have the travel of some of those bikes. So at only 200 millimeter travel, yeah, you're not, you, you still can't go as fast as you could on a bike with longer travel uh, suspension just because you don't have that leeway there for the really big hits. But for a bike with 200 millimeter travel, which is kind of similar to a Tenere 700 or an R1250 GS, something like that, um, it's good. It's very good for that level of travel. But if, you, if, you know, if you're a super fast off-road rider, then you probably should be looking at just a whole nother bike anyway. All right, so let's talk about cost. Now, when I'm doing the install videos in the garage or out riding the bike, I tend to gloss over this quite a bit. Um, just because that's not really on the top of my mind and I don't have all those uh, receipts or invoices in front of me. So let's talk about this. Now, like I said at the front of the video, you don't need to do all this. And I understand a lot of this is just way too expensive for most people. I totally agree with you. Um, however, I'm just showing everything I can on the bike so you can pick what might be good for your uh, personal bike and just to see how good we can make the trans out. So the cost of the build so far, I'm gonna put this up on the screen here. I'll throw this up. Um, so the bike was $10,000 uh, plus tax and fees. It ended up being something like 12, 12, five out the door for me. Um, the phase one, so I have the build broken into phases. So the first video I did, we did the Outback Motortech crash bars and skid plate, bark busters, alt rider foot pegs, the battery upgrade, anti-gravity restart, and the upgrade to the uh, first tires I had, which were the Dunlop Trailmax Raid. So all that totaled $1,620 for phase one. Um, then phase two, which this video covered, the tractive suspension was $3,400. 
uh, 3D cycle part lights were $370, Yoshimura pipe $600, Yoshimura turn signals $270 uh, for the sequential ones, Yoshimura fender eliminator kit $150, and the drive mode dashboard uh, tablet, Android tablet system, a navigation system, was about $600 converted to US currency. So the total for phase two just by itself was $5,300, over $5,300. Ouch, that is really getting up there. Uh, and then phase three, which is gonna be a couple episodes from now, the final mods I do to the bike, is gonna be a tubeless conversion kit, um, which is 160 bucks, and the Viridian Cruise Control, which I still don't have in my possession, but I think is being sent out soon, is uh, $300, and that's fully electronic cruise control. So uh, all that said and done, all three phases, uh, plus the cost of the bike. So total mods are around $7,500, bringing the total cost of the build to around $17,500. Now, a couple things with that. Does that make sense on the surface? No, uh, it doesn't really make sense. And I don't think you should go out and spend this kind of money on your trans out. However, that being said, uh, you know, this bike does bring a lot to the table and is worthy of some of these upgrades. It just depends on what you're looking for. Uh, another thing, any bike you have, you're gonna do upgrades and modifications, and you probably lose track of how much you spend. I think if you were to make a spreadsheet of every little thing you spent on your bike, it's gonna be a lot more than you think. So again, that's something to keep in mind as well. And of course, at the end of the day, you're just gonna choose what kind of upgrades or modifications, if any, you wanna make to your Transalp or to your adventure bike. Honestly, um, if I was just gonna do a Transalp for myself, uh, the only things I'd really, the, the, the main things would be, uh, I would want the cruise control, uh, I would want the protection parts, uh, better tires, uh, and that's about it, honestly. I, I, I could forgo almost everything else, really, if I just had those key things. So anyway, I hope that helps in terms of understanding the cost. All right, well, to wrap this up, I really wanna uh, thank you for watching this. Hope this has been useful. Um, a couple things, so I think this is episode six that we're on, I'm having to look at my notes. Um, we're gonna do an, a few more episodes on the bike. We're gonna do a long distance touring test to see how comfortable the bike is uh, for long distance highway touring, so we're gonna be doing that. We're gonna test out another different set of tires just to throw that in there. Uh, the episode after that, so seven, episode seven will be long distance touring. Episode eight will be comparisons to its closest competitors like the Tenere 700, the V-Storm 800 DE, bikes like that. And it'll also be a Q&A session. I think we'll combine that into episode eight. Episode nine uh, should be uh, the pros and cons and probably like my final thoughts on the trans up. So I think that may be the last episode. There might be one more, I'm not exactly sure. So that's kind of what you uh, have um, uh, in store for you there. Uh, keep in mind, I am getting the uh, new BMW 1300 GS. It's coming about uh, a month from now as I'm filming this right here. So I'm trying to sort of finish the trans out project as I start to get that GS in for testing because that's gonna be taking a lot of my time. I also have the KLX 300 build I'm doing and the Husqvarna FE501S. So check those out too if you want. Uh, and again, just a reminder, anything you wanna buy, uh, or parts, apparel, whatever, please use my shopping links. It's a great way to help support uh, the work I'm doing here on the channel. Thank you so much for watching, ride safe, and I'll see you out there.